appreciate you singing those songs this morning, but 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3 is where we will be today. For those of you that are just joining us, maybe, um, we are walking verse by verse through this book together. Uh, We just happen to be in chapter 3 today. Last week, Pastor David was here, so grateful for him. If you have not had the opportunity to listen to those messages, please go online and take some time and listen to those. If none other, listen to the one on Sunday night. A very, very, very needed message. So, um, and, and listen to it, I guess, with the intent to, to move and be challenged, I guess. Don't just, don't just hear it, but uh, did a great job, and I'm so grateful that he was here Um, So take some opportunity to go back if you didn't get a chance and and listen to that. Today, like I said, we're going to look at chapter 3, and I'm going to share with you a message entitled Unshaken. The title of the message is Unshaken. That comes from verse number 3 where Paul is very concerned about this church. They're suffering. Mainly they're being persecuted for their belief that Jesus Christ or Jesus is the Christ And their decision to follow him and be loyal to him and believe that Jesus is Lord. And so they are suffering persecution. And so verse 3, Paul makes the statement about having sent Timothy. He says, he sent to you to establish you, encourage you so that no one would be shaken by these afflictions. Okay, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. Because here's the deal, adversity, affliction trouble, difficulty, whatever you want to call it, the enemy can use that as a trap for you. Do you realize that? You know, just dealing this past week with, you know, my own challenges, plus walking with others through their challenges, I'm reminded of this, of how easily the enemy can use adversity and trouble and difficulty in your life as a trap to ensnare you in selfishness. He would love to ensnare you in selfishness. He would love to ensnare you in bitterness. The enemy would love for you to be mad at God and mad at the world, mad at whoever's caused this trouble for you. He would love to ensnare you in anger, in doubt, in confusion. The enemy's mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. You know that. That's not my, that's John 10. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. But the devil's mission is to steal, kill, and destroy and destroy. And so he would love to rob you of the blessing for your time in the heat, so to speak. God's got you there to refine you. God's got you there to grow you. He's got you on the potter's wheel to shape and mold you so that your life reflects more of his life. Devil wants to rob you of that blessing. It's a trap wants to trap you on that island of self because you know it and I know it. One of the first things that happens to us when it's going bad is we can easily turn inward, right? Woe is me. Why me? God, what have I done? You know? But Paul is concerned about this for the church Verse 5, if you look at it, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. He knew that trouble, adversity was a trap. And he knew that if the devil could get them turned inward, that his labor would have been in vain. Because Paul preached the gospel that they would be set free. Paul preached the grace of God so that they could finally, once for all in their life, focus on somebody other than themselves. So Paul knew it was a trap. He was very concerned about the situation. So what is the way of escape? How do you escape the trap? How do you stand strong and thrive in adversity? How do you become like Paul? How do you become unshaken? Because that's what the Bible says about Paul. He was unshaken. And it's hard for me to believe that when I read chapters like 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that give the details of all the things that he experienced in his life just doing what God told him to do. 
and yet he was unshaken. So what is, what is the key to that? Well, the key, and I'll go ahead and give you the answer, the key is the mission. What is the key to being unshaken? It's embracing the mission for which God redeemed you from this life into another life, and he's given you a purpose. He's given you meaning. And so when we embrace that, I want to talk about how much that impacts our ability to deal with affliction. Pastor David said something last week that I'll never forget. And I'd love to just ask you guys how many of you caught it. But he said something so powerful. He told of a story one time when his son came to him and said, Dad, what can I do for you? Now, when he said that, I was kind of thinking, hmm, that's pretty awesome. (laughs) How many of you have had your kids come to you lately and said, hey, what can I do for you? (laughs) But what he went on to say is he said, that's the mark of growing up. That's the mark of maturity. And so you know how it is. I mean, what's your relationship with God? I mean, how many times in our prayer life are we just simply begging God to do what we want him to do for us? God, fix this, fix that. Give me this job, give me that. God, do this, do that. I mean, how many of us were using God like that? Instead of just showing up first thing in the morning going, Father, I'm here. What can I do for you today? What can I do to make you known? What can I do to glorify you? It's a mark of maturity. So are you mature? Have you grown in your faith? Are you focused on what the Father wants to do through you in the life of others, other people? studying the book of Jude on Wednesday nights. Love for you to join us, just going verse by verse through it. But one of the things Jude says early on is he tells the church that you have been entrusted with the truth. You've been trusted with the faith, this body of of truth. God has entrusted that to you. He says, contend for it. He says, contend for it, fight for it, stand for that truth. So we not only stand for it, but we are called to invest that, deposit that into the lives of others. And this is who Paul was. And you may have never put the two together, but I honestly believe this is why he was so unshaken in the trials of life. It's because he was solely committed to the mission that God had given him. And we see this. Look at verse 7 and 8 real quick of chapter 3. He says, therefore, brethren, in all, listen to this statement. I've I've taught through this book like four or five times. I've never seen this. But he says, in all of our affliction and distress, we were comforted. We were comforted concerning you by your faith. So how is Paul being comforted? How is Paul being strengthened? How is Paul avoiding being shaken in the midst of what he's facing? How is he doing it? It's because others are thriving in Jesus. Let me do something real quick. Take your Bible and turn back to the left with me. We'll stay here in Paul's letters, and I want you just to see something with me for a moment. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Because Paul makes that statement about how in all of our affliction and distress we were comforted concerning you by your faith. Then he says in verse 8, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Wow, what a statement. But go back to Second Corinthians chapter 11, and I want you to look with me at verse number 23. Second Corinthians 11, verse 23. Look at that. Paul describes in these few verses some of these afflictions, some of these things that he has experienced. And what are they? And labors, well, what does that mean? if you study that out, what that refers to are the times in Paul's life where he had 
gone at it so hard that he was literally to the point of exhaustion. And what are we screaming at people like that? Slow down. Paul's like, I can't. I'm chasing something bigger than me. Can't take my eyes off of it for one minute. Because the second I take my eyes off of it, the enemy, the devil will have something to put in front of my face. Labors, stripes. Anybody want to take a guess at what that means? Times he was beaten. Prisons and deaths often. What does that mean? Well, I do know Paul was stoned one time to the point of death. He died and God brought him back to life. Why is he experiencing this, y'all? You think about that. He's he's experiencing it because he has embraced the mission. He has embraced the fact that in this life, others and their relationship with God is more important than himself, his own comfort, and his own safety. So therefore, he is unshaken. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. And even a guy from Maiden can do that math. 39 stripes, 39 times by the Jews. And then it says, I think the Gentiles, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times shipwrecked. Why? He's going to different places. It's the way they traveled in a night and day I've been in the deep well what is he talking about there it sounds like to me that he literally because he was shipwrecked he was out floating around in the ocean for for a day and a night anybody want to sign up for that but yet he's still unshaken unshaken And, and I'm blown away by how little it takes to shake me that's what's so convicting about this passage Just how little it takes to shake me and get me off course. And then it goes on, and you can read this. But in the midst of all of these, Paul is unshaken. So what can we learn from Paul? You see, through God's word, we're enabled to kind of peek in and we're able to, to see. And it's not just really Paul, but what Paul learned, he learned from Jesus. Jesus was unshaken. Jesus always stayed the course. Praise God. But the answer is the same. It's the mission. So let me give you a few of these keys to you and I being able to, to live in this life unshaken no matter what the world throws at us. Because I can just about guarantee you, and I don't know this, but I doubt seriously we're going to go through what Paul did. It may be coming. Our generation may see it. Okay, so you're, you're, you know, but are we prepared for it? Number one, it was the mindset. It was Paul's mindset. You could just write down his vision. It's the way he looked at the world. See, the Bible says, and David quoted this proverb last week, without vision, what happens? People perish. But if you have the right vision, the right spiritual vision, if you're, if you're going to look at this world through God's eyes, Man, will it make a difference in how you and I deal with affliction. See, your vision is the lens through which you're looking at everything. And when I read these verses, look look back at verse 1. I know I've kind of skipped down through this. But Paul says in verse 1, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left alone in Athens. And we sent Timothy, our brother, minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you, encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Now underline that. Because God wants to make it very clear to any of those who will follow him, you have to know that th- we are destined for this. We, we, if we are serious about following Jesus, about the mission, you are going to suffer. 
It's not always going to be a pat on the back from everybody. Hey, you're doing a great job. Especially in the direction we're headed. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened. And you know, because for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. So what, what is Paul seeing? What is his mindset? I mean, if you go back and read the book of Acts, you can see that when he was run out of Thessalonica, he didn't just stop his ministry. He went to other places. And if you go back and read, it blows my mind that Paul has anybody else on his mind other than himself. I I mean, really, that blows me away. But Paul is consumed with these people. And why is he consumed with them? Because he was sent on a mission to make disciples, and he's concerned about where they are. You see, decision, a decision was not enough for him. It wasn't enough just to show show up in Thessalonica, preach the gospel, and then say, hey, everybody who believes, raise your hand. We're good. Oh, there's 30 or 40 of you. And then just go to the next. It wasn't enough for him. He wanted to see them mature. He wanted them to be fruitful. He wanted them to be unshaken in the midst of life's struggles. Paul had a lot going on, but yet he was consumed by the mission. He was committed to the great commission. He was committed to the strategy that he had seen in Jesus. Paul's mind was so filled with how others were doing that he didn't have time, obviously, to think much about himself. God has created our mind to do this thing. Your mind cannot think about two things at once. Now, you might can do two things or three things at one time, but your mind literally cannot think but about one thing at a time. And so a huge part of Paul being unshaken in this life is because he was so consumed with seeing others excel in their relationship with Jesus that he didn't have a whole lot of time to think about himself or what if this or what if that or what if that doesn't work out or what you see what I'm saying? Your mind can only think about one thing at a time. And Paul was consumed with the mission. He was consumed with where others stood in their relationship with him. See, the problem with modern preaching today is that it focuses you on you. There's very little of preaching today that is turning the world away from themselves out to the mission, to others. I, I mean, I honestly believe that the mission is the greatest cure for your anxiety. I honestly believe that, 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 that the, the mission is the greatest cure for your depression because it gets you involved in something that matters. It gets you involved in God's stuff. It gets you involved in eternal stuff. What do you see? I'm going to pick at you for a minute if you don't mind. We ride around here, and I've lived here now for 11 years, and there's one thing you know about this area. Just right here, there are a lot of houses going up. Let me ask you, what do you see, though? And I, I'm, I'm being very understanding here and sensitive to the fact some of you, you love the country, you've lived in the country, and you just hate to see all the houses, and, and you know, and I, and I get that. You struggle with that. You know, I, I get it, but really, at the end, of what do you see? There's some people that will never see past the problem of that. But then there are those that would look upon the situation with the eyes of God and what they would see was they would see people. They would see souls. They would see people that are literally taking their next steps and they're headed towards hell. They would see them from an eternal perspective and say, wow, God, look at all these people you're bringing right next door to us. So we have an opportunity. What do you see? See, that's the difference. See, for a lot of us, when we go through affliction, all we can see is the pain. All we can see is the problem. We're not seeing 
And thinking about what God said, that every single time of adversity in your life is really an opportunity for growth. I'm the great refiner. I am the the potter with the clay. Rejoice when you fall into various trials because I'm up to something good in your life. But a lot of times we can't see past the problem or the pain to see the promise. And so therefore we get shaken. The enemy uses it to trap us in bitterness and selfishness. And next thing you know, rather than being a blessing to people around us, we become a burden. Anybody ever been a burden to people? Listen, selfish people are a burden to everybody. Selfish people are a burden to everybody. How we see is everything. Paul has found unshakable joy in life because he has chosen to live to see others excel in Jesus. But beware of the trap. Beware of the devil who wants to use this to get you focused on you, to get you trapped on that island of self, of, oh, I don't deserve this. You get angry at God and you're angry at the circumstances or whoever's caused the difficulty for you. Beware of the trap. It was his mindset. It was his mindset. See, Jesus looked on the multitudes, and what did he see? He saw, he saw sheep without a shepherd. Do we see that? The mindset. Number two, the action or the obedience. You see, Paul was not just writing well wishes to the church at Thessalonica. Like, oh, I'm thinking about you and I'm, I'm praying for you. You know, like, like, like the, time, the things we do. But we're really not thinking about people. We're really not praying a lot of times, but, but we say that. He's not just saying or writing well wishes to them. He's not just saying, I want to see you. He's tried to get there, but he's already told us the devil hindered him from doing it. He stopped it. But even then, Paul didn't throw up his hands and give up. The mission was so important to him that he had already invested in this man, Timothy. And so he's like, well, if I can't go, I'll stay here. And guess what? I'll send Timothy to you. I mean, Timothy was his right-hand man. Do you remember what happened to Paul and his guys the last time they were in Thessalonica? They were run out of town. So if they go back, do you think it's going to be easy for them? I mean, it might get worse. I mean, Paul understands what's at stake. He understands that this could very well mean the life of Timothy. But those people are so important. And doing and acting upon the Great Commission is important for him. He made it happen. He's not just sitting around sulking in his trouble. There's no time for his mind to spend with all the what-ifs and all the uncertainty. He couldn't go, but he sends Timothy. You see, for us to have God's vision, but to have no plan or no action, that's a dream. That's all that is, is a dream. But to have a vision or the vision of God and to have a plan, to have that strategy, but no action, that's not just a dream. That is a haunting dream. Because you see it, you have the strategy for it, but you're doing nothing about it. But to have the vision of God with his strategy, with that plan, and you put action to it, what you're going to have is what Paul had, and that is a spiritually productive ministry. Timothy's mission, according to Paul, was to go there to establish verse 2 and to encourage the people in their faith. Why? So that no one would be shaken with these afflictions that was the point that word established is very interesting you ought to look it up sometime and study it but the idea is to strengthen but in the word itself these people are going to be strengthened as Timothy goes to them and as Timothy makes sure that they are on the right course It means to direct a person on the right path. That's what that word's all about. 
And so he knows the enemy is there. He knows what a trap affliction can be and adversity can be for us. And so he's like, man, I've got to get somebody there to continue to hold up the truth that sets men free, to continue to send them on the right path, not inwardly focused, but outwardly focused on others and their relationship with God. Because as they walk with God and as they engage in the mission, that in of itself, just like it did for Paul, is going to provide enough strength to continue pressing on unshaken. Does that make any sense? See, you love progress, amen? A a football coach or a basketball coach, they work hard. They put effort. They put time. They love to see their team getting better. They love to see them go on the court or on the field and win games because they know they're making progress. It's encouraging. But if you're not engaged in the mission, if you're not sowing the seed, then you're you're not going to be able to be a part of that progress. But for Paul, the progress, what he was seeing It had a supernatural power to it, an ability to lift him outside of himself and give him joy even in the most adverse circumstances. That's mind-blowing to me. I want to ask you a question. What if the world were filled with nothing but hearers and no doers? I mean, how would you like to go to work tomorrow and all you've got is a bunch of employees or a bunch of coworkers? All they do is hear and they do nothing. Would that be exciting for you? I mean, you've got people, hey, do this, do that. Or your coworkers, they know what to do, but they're doing. They're doing nothing about it. got to ask ourselves that church are we hearers do we have the vision are we putting any action to it I've been talking teaching with the students over the past few weeks and started with this little study by asking how would you describe your relationship with God Would you describe it as something that's alive, something that's thriving, something that's really, really exciting? How would you describe your relationship with God now? Or is it something that's kind of dry and dull and sort of dead and unexciting? And it's it's just kind of, if you you were honest, you'd say, well, pretty much the extent of it is when I come in these doors and that's kind of it, really. But that's not what it has to be. It starts with a desire in your heart. It then moves to what God has said and what God has told us and then us being willing to act that out. Because if I know what God said and I'm not doing anything to it, how am I going to expect? Because when you look at the Bible, it's amazing how many times you see a person's desire They bring whatever's going on to Jesus. God speaks. They believe God. And then a miracle happens. I can't expect to see the miracle of salvation in my life if I'm not sharing the gospel with anybody. Does that make sense? And I'm not being sarcastic. I'm just like, I'm not going to see it if I'm not willing to pass the gospel on to someone else if I'm not willing to sow that seed. I'm not going to experience the blessing of seeing a believer encouraged in the midst of their difficulty if I'm not willing to open my mouth and speak to them the truth and promises of God. You get, you get what I'm saying. You get it. You see, Paul is unshaken because he's in the middle of the action. And he's watching. He's seeing firsthand God at work and and you take his trials which gosh to me seem huge but then you take what he's seeing God do and it's like you can't shake him you can't can't get him off off course for anything And and a lot of people you let one bad thing happen and immediately we're like God 
what are you doing? Why is this? What do I do? What? So what were the keys to his being unshaken? Despite the circumstance, what was the mindset? It was his obedience. But then last of all, it was prayer. Look at how this passage ends in verse 9. Paul says, for what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God. In other words, Paul is so full of joy in seeing what God is doing in the life of these believers that like he's just overflowing with thanksgiving. And then he says in verse 10, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. Prayer was the key. You notice in all these things, who is Paul ultimately trusting to do the work? It's not himself. He realizes he's just a mouthpiece. He realizes he's just a tool in the hands of God, but he's trusting the Father. He's not carrying this this burden of, oh my goodness, I went into Thessalonica and yeah, a lot of them got saved, but a lot of them didn't get saved. And oh, no, 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 it's just, God, this is your mission. This is your work. I trust you to continue to do it. Amazing how unshakable we would be To just trust God with our circumstances and that he is sovereign and in control. Paul's saying, I'm moving God, but I'm trusting you to do it. What's he praying for? Well, he's praying, first of all, for a reunion. Again, remember the mission. I want to get there and I want to perfect. I want to complete everything that is lacking in you because I want you to stand before God as a perfect man, mature, being fruitful reproducing right so he's praying for that reunion another thing he's praying for is for their love to overflow like here's literally the picture he wants God's love to so overflow in their lives right he wants it to so overflow that it literally spills out onto the people that are around them that's what he's praying for because that's what's important love the love of God love towards this world he's also praying for them to be prepared for the return of Jesus How many parables, church, do we have in the Bible where Jesus is talking about the servants of the master being prepared when the master returns? He's praying for them to be confident at the appearing of Jesus. I mean, how many of us, if Jesus came now, would we be confident? You say, oh, it'd be great to see him. But I mean, I'm talking about as a servant who has been given a very clear and specific task. If we, if we just, hey, he's coming. Because I know a lot of times growing up, my dad would leave a list at the house and want me to do all this stuff. And then you know what? I'd kind of hear, or get word, hey, he's on his way back. or he might. And guess what I'd be doing? I'd be getting that list done. That's the point that I'm trying to make. You see, we're talking about how excited we are to see Jesus, but really? I mean, is he going to come back and show up finding you, his servant, doing what he left you here to do? See, you can make it whatever you want to make it. But the, ser- the master has been very clear about what our task is on this earth. Very clear. Very clear about his mission. Now, you can make it whatever you want. But I promise you, you won't be excited when he shows up. You may think you're looking forward to that day, but Paul prays, God, I want them to be prepared. I want them to be ready when Jesus shows up. And so I want to see them perfected. I want to see them mature. I want to see them focus, focusing outward on the world, doing what God has called us to do, which is to go into this world and everywhere we go to make disciples. As a result, either Paul's a liar or he's telling the truth. 
Either he's a liar or he's telling the truth. And if he's telling the truth, he says, no matter what the inconvenience is, no matter what the difficulty, no matter what the affliction, we found joy. We live because you're living, because you're excelling. That blows my mind, especially when I think about how easily I'm shaken in this life. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the preciousness of your word. Word which contains truth. It contains the information so we can have it, so that we can be prepared. And as Paul was seeking to do in the lives of this church, that we can open this word and we can read this word and study this word and we too can live an unshakable life no matter what comes our way. Help us to see, God, the importance of the mission in all of this. Help us to find joy in seeing others excel in their relationship with you. God, teach us to stop making our Christian life about a building and and different things and stuff that we minimize it down to to begin to see it that it's a part of every day restore to us the joy of that relationship the life of it the excitement of it and help us see it as we find that joy in your mission and focusing on the world around us father we thank you for that and we pray these things in jesus name Amen.